Let's turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. And we're going to read the verses 36 through 50 of that uh, chapter. And the entire passage that we read really is our text uh, for this evening. So Luke 7, beginning at verse 36 and reading through to uh, verse uh, 50. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and to wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with, the, with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. May the Lord uh, help us to have a right grasp of his word as we look at that passage uh, together this evening. So our text is uh, Luke chapter 7 and the verses 36 through 50. Notice that there in verse 37... Uh, the verse begins, and behold, uh, there was actually something here that was noteworthy. A woman in the city, uh, we informed who was a sinner, when she saw that uh, Jesus sat at meat in the house of Simon the Pharisee, uh, brought an alabaster box or an alabaster flask uh, full of ointment, and she stood at his feet, and as she stood there, she began to weep. And uh, from the moisture of her tears, uh, she then began to wash the uh, feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with the hairs of her head. And at the same time, she kissed his feet, anointing those feet with the ointment that she would brought. Quite an outstanding uh, event there in that house of Simon the Pharisee. The woman referred to here is described as significantly as a sinner. The description, a sinner, indicates that she was in fact a notorious and habitual sinner. Not told the nature of this woman's sin, some surmise that she may have been a prostitute, and that was possibly true. 
but we're simply not told. In any event, her reputation as a sinner preceded her. And so therefore it comes as a surprise to read that this woman came into the house of Simon the Pharisee. And furthermore, it's also surprising to learn that while she was there, she washed the feet of Jesus, dried them as we've mentioned, kissed them and anointed them with an expensive oil. Why would the woman do such things? Why, first of all, would she venture into the house of uh, Simon, a Pharisee, given that she was, in fact, a sinner, a great sinner? And why would she wash the feet of Jesus with her tears and wipe his feet with her hair and then furthermore kiss them and then also then anoint his feet with expensive oils? The answer to those questions is because she loved much. Her actions, you see, reflected the depth of her love for Jesus. For this woman, as is true of every believer, love for Jesus Christ was the energising force of her life. For the believer, love for Jesus Christ explains every good work. Out of love for Jesus Christ, the believer worships him. Out of love for him, the believer labours in the church and the kingdom. Out of love for him, the believer brings their gifts and gives to the work of the Lord. Out of love for Jesus Christ, uh, the believer marries in the Lord. Out of love for him, the believer nurtures the children of the church. Out of love for him, uh, we keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Out of love for him, we take up our cross daily. When we have been brought to the, by the Spirit of Christ uh, to a realisation of the enormity of our sins and the greatness and the glory of the salvation and the undeserved nature of that salvation that is to be found in Jesus Christ, no other response but love for Jesus Christ is appropriate. Our text sets before us here the true relationship between salvation, our salvation, and the Christian life. Interestingly, the order is not, as some suggest, that first we manifest our love for Jesus and on that basis he then saves us. Jesus does not save us because we first loved him. But we love him because he first loved us. In other words, God's work of grace in us is always first. And that's evident from the woman here in our text. She loved Jesus. On account of her love for him, she was willing to come into the house of Simon the Pharisee in order to give expression to her love. Every aspect of her behaviour in Simon's house was a reflection of her love for Jesus. She was not there seeking, though, the forgiveness of her sins and salvation, but she was there because, having been made spiritually alive by the Spirit of God, she loved Jesus and was determined to show her love for him. Such was... Uh, the reason why the woman uh, came into the house of Simon. And what that woman was doing is, brethren, what you and I as believers would also to do every day. So I've described or title, entitled the message this evening, A Sinner's Love for Jesus and I've divided the sermon under these three headings. Firstly, a sinner's love manifested. Secondly, a sinner's love explained. And then finally, a sinner's love confirmed. Every sinner who comes to salvation in Jesus Christ ought every day to manifest in practical ways their love for their Saviour. The woman in our text did that. And we also will do that if we grasp the enormity of the gift that we have received 
from our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ. The woman in our text manifested her love for Jesus at a feast, we are told here, in, a, in the house of Simon the Pharisee, a feast to which Jesus himself uh, had been invited. That Simon the Pharisee should invite Jesus to a feast at his home in itself is somewhat intriguing. As a Pharisee, the only Messiah to which Simon uh, looked was a Messiah who would deliver the Jews uh, from the oppression of the Romans and who would seek to restore the uh, glory of the kingdom of David and Solomon. And furthermore, as a Pharisee, Simon would have been a zealous observer of the law in the light of his conviction that by his meticulous observance of the law, he could actually earn a place in heaven itself. Emboldened by his sense of uh, self-righteousness, Simon, as was characteristic of the Pharisees, was a censorious, judgmental critic of others. And so consequently, he looked with disdain and disgust upon sinners, particularly notorious sinners such as this woman that's uh, referenced here in our text. The fact that Simon was a Pharisee uh, only serves, in fact, to make more remarkable uh, what this woman did. We told them, verse 37, 38, Behold, the woman in the city which was a sinner brought an alabaster bo box of ointment, stood behind Jesus, weeping, began to wash his feet with her tears, and then wiped his feet with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. What she did was quite remarkable. It was quite remarkable even that this woman should actually dare to enter into the house of Simon, uh, who was a Pharisee. Uh, it's not so surprising that she might actually enter into his house. Uh, uninvited guests were quite commonly in that day uh, invited to be present at uh, such feasts. So that in itself was not altogether unusual. Uh, Indeed, members of the public were often permitted to stand against the walls at such feasts so that they might actually watch and observe. But what made the woman's presence remarkable was that she was, in fact, as we've noted, a notorious sinner. And as a notorious sinner, that she should be so bold as to venture into the house of Simon, a noted Pharisee. That Simon was a Pharisee was... Uh, well known. Uh, in fact, we see here that that's indicated by the fact that Jesus, we're told, sat at meat in the Pharisee's house. Uh, just as the woman's reputation as regards her sin preceded her, so too did Simon's reputation as a Pharisee. So therefore, for this woman uh, to enter into Simon's house was to invite, uh, in probability, uh, public ridicule and scorn. What was also remarkable about this woman's attendance at Simon's house uh, lay, as we've seen, in what she did on that occasion. Uh, you might be aware that feasts in that day were usually set around low-set U-shaped tables so that the guests could sit or recline on their elbows with their heads positioned toward the table. And as Jesus reclined there at the table with his feet positioned away from the table, this woman came and stood near his feet. And as she did that, she began to weep. And with tears streaming down her face, uh, there in the very presence of all these assembled guests, she proceeded to wash the feet of Jesus with her tears. And not only did she do that, but then she proceeded to dry his feet uh, with the hairs of her head. And following that, she anointed his feet with alabaster ointment. And alabaster ointment was an expensive perfume. And all the while that she was doing these things, she actually kissed, repeatedly kissed his feet. Now Simon observed that. And he did so with disapproval. You notice that being aware of Simon's 
critical analysis of what he observed, Jesus then proceeds to relate a parable to Simon. This was the parable. There was a creditor and uh, two debtors. One of the debtors owed to the creditor a comparatively large sum of money, some 500 pence or literally 500 denarii. Uh, that was equivalent to perhaps a man's ordinary wage of, uh, of about a year and a half. So one man owes these uh, 500 uh, denarii. The other owed a much smaller amount, uh, 50 denarii. And though the size of their debts differed, the debtors had this in common. Neither man had the capacity to repay uh, their debts. But then you have the extraordinary, extraordinary revelation in verse 42. And when they had nothing to pay, uh, Frank, the uh, creditor, we're told, frankly forgave them both. The word frankly there means literally freely, graciously. So these men can't pay their debts, but the creditor freely and graciously cancelled the debt of both of them. And then Jesus poses this question to Simon. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love most? Simon responds, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And Jesus affirms the correctness of Simon's assessment. He says to Simon, you have rightly judged. The question then arises, why the parable? What's the purpose of the parable? What's the message uh, of the parable? By the means of the parable, Jesus was explaining the behaviour of this woman. As Jesus declares of this woman in verse 30, 47, she loved much. Everything that the woman did in the house of Simon uh, at, on, at the occasion of that feast was motivated by her love for Jesus. Her love for Jesus was not only nor even primarily a feeling or an emotion but it was something that affected and impacted her whole being. This woman loved Jesus much and that love manifested itself in her actions. It manifested itself in what she did, in how she lived. It was her love for Jesus that led her to enter into the house of Simon. Now that would have taken courage on her part. As we've noted, she knew that Simon was a Pharisee and she no doubt also would have known that many of his guests would also have been Pharisees. And her reputation was that of a sinner and her reputation was a well-known one. And yet here she comes into the midst of of the house of Simon the Pharisee, a despised sinner. Her love for Jesus was so great that she was willing to bear the likely ridicule and disapproving looks that her presence would inevitably attract in order that she might draw near to Jesus. And furthermore, by means of her tears, the use of her hair, the gift of the oil, this woman, in a very practical way, demonstrated her love for Jesus. Interestingly, the washing of his feet uh, with her tears, the wiping of his feet uh, with the hairs of her head, and the anointing of his feet with oil were not beneath the dignity of this woman. Such was the depth of her love for Jesus.
Brethren, if we are those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, if we are the recipients of the gift of salvation that is to be found in him, the response of this woman ought also to reflect our response to Jesus Christ. Ask yourself, do you think that you have been forgiven much? Is that your conception of salvation, of your salvation? To whom much is forgiven, the same will love much. If you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, if I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and if we consider that we have been forgiven much, ought we not openly and unashamedly manifest our love for him? The point of the parable is that that's just exactly what we will do. And we'll do that if we consider that we have been forgiven much. As the undeserved beneficiaries of God's grace in Jesus Christ, as the recipients of salvation, brethren, you and I ought to, in a very practical way, express our love for him. And so the question arises, how might we do that? How might we give very practical expression uh, to our love for Jesus Christ? The expression of our love, I would suggest, ought to be informed uh, by the actions of the woman here in Luke 7. Just as she sought to draw near to Jesus, so we ought also to seek to draw near to him. And just as she sought and desired to be in his presence, so we ought to seek and desire to be in his presence. And today that will mean uh, not attendance at a feast at which Jesus is presence, present, but it mean, will mean that we will attend upon him. We will attend upon him uh, in worship. We will attend upon him uh, through the use of the means of grace. If we love Jesus Christ, we will be found uh, in his house and we will sit under the means of grace and under the preaching of his word. And we'll seek that he will apply his word to us uh, by his spirit. It's through the word and through the work of his spirit that we're actually enabled to draw near to him. Uh, it's, it's through the word and through his spirit that we hear him speak to us. It's through those very means that we have fellowship and communion with him. It's how we actually in the uh, terms of, the, of this uh, passage, it's how we touch him. It's how we kiss him. Obviously not physically, but spiritually. Furthermore, as those who have been forgiven much, we ought to be those who express our love for Jesus by consecrating our lives to him. Uh, Paul reflects that in the passage we read this evening in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. There he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We ought to express our love for Jesus by rendering to him obedient service, by confessing him before men, by living in the consciousness of his presence by living as those who have been redeemed 
and by his blood. And loving Jesus much, we will not be deterred uh, from seeking him. We'll not let the Simons of this world with their disapproving looks and their disparaging words uh, drive us away. We'll not be put off by their scorn, nor by their vitriol, nor by their ridicule. Our love will be marked, as was the case here with this woman, our love will be marked by genuine humility. We will contentedly serve him in whatever way he requires. We'll utilise the gifts and the talents that he's given us in his service and we'll serve him in ways that others may even view as lowly and servile. And if necessary, we will wash his feet with our tears and dry them with the hairs of our head. You know, often men and women express an eagerness uh, to serve uh, Jesus Christ, but they express an eagerness to serve him only on their own terms. Uh, they lack humility. Hence they balk at lowly tasks. Uh, their desire is for a higher profile, a grander stage, greater recognition. So consequently, they're unwilling to wash the Saviour's feet with their tears and to dry them with the hairs of their head. They're reluctant, for example, to befriend the lonely, to care for the destitute, to exercise patience with the aged, to care for the seriously ill, to help the weak and the infirmed, to show hospitality to the stranger. They're reluctant to comfort the depressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to draw alongside those uh, who are struggling, to contribute where help is genuinely needed. They're reluctant to perform what they perceive to be menial tasks. They love Jesus on their own terms. And the truth is their love for Jesus is not very much. Their concern is not so much about Jesus, but their concern is about self. So they're loving Jesus much that means that we will give generously uh, to his cause. We will give our alabaster box of ointment. We'll contribute to the needs of the church. We'll support uh, the ministry of the word. We'll support Christian education. We'll support the causes of the kingdom, not just with monetary gifts, We'll give of our time and our energy and our gifts and our talents. And those gifts might be not necessarily our physical gifts, but they might be the gifts of our minds and of our intellect, our creative gifts, gifts of our hands, the gifts of our homemaking, the gifts of kindness, the gifts of tenderness. We're not to be the Simons of this world. Did you know, so far as the parable was concerned, not only was the woman depicted in Jesus' parable, uh, if you hadn't realised that she was the debtor who owed the 500 pence, but not only was the woman depicted in Jesus' parable, but so too was Simon and all who were like him. Simon's also depicted in this parable. Simon was the debtor who owed only 50 pence. He owed, in his own estimation, only a little, only a very, very small debt. 
And so consequently from his perspective, having been forgiven only a little, uh, he loved only a little. In truth, what that means is that Simon did not love Jesus Christ at all. Immersed in his pharisaical thinking, you see, Simon did not conceive of himself as having any debt that needed to be forgiven. He had no need of a saviour. And Simon certainly did not look to Jesus Christ as his saviour, and nor did he love him. Now, Jesus' parable here is actually full of irony. It's not possible to love only a little. When Jesus spoke in the parable of those who loved only a little, he was referring to those who in truth did not love at all. Just as the woman's love for Jesus manifested itself in concrete ways, so also Simon's lack of love for Jesus also manifested itself in concrete ways. By his conduct, as we read in verses 44 through 46, uh, Simon uh, demonstrated his lack of love for Jesus in a number of ways. There Jesus says to him, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the, te- with the hairs of her head. And he goes on furthermore to say, Thou gavest me no kiss. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. When Jesus came to Simon's house, Simon neglected to supply him with even the basic courtesies. No water to wash his feet. Water for washing of feet was usual in that day. Indeed, it was a necessity in that day due to the open sandals and the dusty roads. Nor did Simon greet Jesus with a kiss when Jesus came into his house, which was also customary. Nor did, nor did Simon anoint Jesus' feet with oil, again a common custom and an indication of respect. Simon did not bestow upon Jesus even the most basic uh, uh, care. His failure to do so openly manifested his lack of love for Jesus. Simon had no respect for Jesus. Simon, in fact, had invited Jesus uh, to his house for ulterior motives. He was intent on establishing to his own satisfaction that Jesus was not who he claimed actually to be. And that's why when he sees the woman touching Jesus, he immediately concludes that Jesus was not a prophet. We read there in verse 39, Now when when the Pharisee which had had bidden him saw it, as saw Jesus being touched by this woman, he spoke within himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And in that incident, Simon uh, discovered to his delight Apparent confirmation of the thing that he already believed, namely that Jesus was not the Christ. There are those like Simon in the, in uh, in Christendom today. Uh, sometimes they're even members of the church, the visible church of Jesus Christ. Attend church, they profess love for Jesus, perhaps even making a public profession of their faith. But in truth, they do not love him. They're like Simon. Their sins, if they acknowledge them, in their estimation, are insignificant. They lack a proper appreciation of the greatness and the enormity of their sins. In their minds, they have little or nothing 
that requires forgiveness. In being forgiven a little, they love little. And that's reflected in how they live. They don't desire to draw near to Jesus Christ. They have no zeal uh, for his word and for his truth. They have no time to labour in the service of his kingdom. And they're reluctant to contribute their gifts or their resources in, into his service. But then what you should take from this word of God is this. It's not possible uh, to love Jesus Christ only a little. Uh, those who love Jesus Christ love him much. Either you love him much or the truth is you don't love him at all. If the Spirit of God has worked in your heart, if the Spirit of God has worked in my heart, uh, we will have an appreciation of the enormity of our sins, of the greatness of our debt. And we will know that we have been forgiven much. We will recognise just how great sinners we are. And then we will recognise also the greatness of the salvation that has been purchased by our Saviour Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. And as we grasp those things, as we appreciate those things, we will love Jesus Christ much. And that love for Jesus Christ will actually be evident in our lives day by day. That's the issue. That's the issue that is drawn to our attention here and that's the issue uh, that uh, we are called to take note of here. It really poses this question to us. Is my love for Jesus Christ real? And is my love for Jesus Christ evident in practical ways in my daily life? This woman loved uh, Jesus Christ much. She knew that she was a sinner and she knew what it was to be saved uh, by Jesus Christ. When she came to the feast at Simon's house, uh, we should understand that she had already uh, come to a place of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. It had already been a work of the Spirit of God in the heart of this woman. And that's not stated in our text, but it is to be deduced from the teaching of Jesus. Sometime before this woman came to the house of Simon, she had come under the ministry of Jesus. It's apparent that this was not the first encounter that this woman had had with Jesus of Nazareth. He already lived uh, by his spirit within her heart. And she knew that in him, her debt of sin, which was considerable, had been forgiven. And that's why she loved him. Now that might seem, perhaps, as you read verses 47 and 47 and 48, uh, to be con contradicted by those verses. You notice, speaking to Simon about this woman, Jesus says uh, to her in verse uh, 47, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. And then in verse 48, Jesus turns to the woman and says to her, thy sins are forgiven. Now it might be thought from verses 47 and 48 that the woman attained unto forgiveness 
because she showed a great love for Jesus by washing his feet with her tears and drying them with the hairs of her head. The thought being that she was a sinful woman when she came to the feast, but because she showed her love for Jesus in the way that she did, Jesus declares her sins to be forgiven. In other words, her forgiveness might be suggested that her forgiveness was uh, contingent upon or depended upon her love for Jesus. The order being the manifestation of her love for Jesus first, forgiveness and salvation following on as a consequence of her love. Uh, that, by the way, is exactly how the relationship between salvation and the Christian life is presented in many places in Christendom uh, today. Salvation being dependent upon the sinner's love uh, for Jesus, the sinner earning their salvation. But that is contrary to Scripture. Scripture teaches plainly that our salvation is purely of grace. It is not earned. It is not contingent upon our loving Jesus first. Uh, significantly, uh, most significantly in fact, the notion that salvation is dependent upon a sinner's love for Jesus uh, stands contrary to Jesus' parable here in our text. Notice this, the creditor had a debtor who owed him a large sum. And we're told that the creditor frankly forgave him that debt. In other words, the creditor freely and graciously forgave that man that debt. You should note it was because the creditor forgave the debt that the debtor loved the creditor much. The debtor's love flowed from having been forgiven much. Forgiveness of the debt was first, followed by the manifestation of love. Furthermore, it should be noted that Jesus does not say to the woman when he dismisses her that her love saved her, but he says that her faith saved her. That's verse 50. He said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. This woman was saved by faith, not by her love for Jesus Christ. By means of her faith in Jesus Christ, a faith born of the Spirit of God, her faith being a gift of grace, she received the forgiveness of her sins and then faith expressed itself as it always does in her love for Jesus. Then you might say, what then did Jesus mean when he says in verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are or have been forgiven, for she loved much. Here Jesus was saying to Simon that it is evident that this woman whose sins were great had been forgiven. The evidence of the forgiveness of her sins was there for all to see. What was that evidence? It was that she loved much. In the washing of Jesus' feet with the tears, in the drying of uh, his uh, uh, body with her, the hair of her head, the woman manifested that there had been a work of grace in her heart, she manifested that her sins had been forgiven. Her love for Jesus and the manifestation of that love was proof that her sins had been forgiven. Simon was not wrong when he identified this woman as a sinner. She was a great sinner and her sins had been many. But that did not prevent Jesus from covering her sins and removing her debt. Indeed, he forgave her a great debt. And it was on account of the forgiveness of that great debt that this woman loved 
in much. And thankfully for us, Jesus Christ saves great sinners. Finally, just notice also what Jesus says to this woman in verse 50. He says to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. In those words, Jesus confirmed the genuineness of the woman's love. It's not that this woman was saved by her faith, it is by her act of believing. Believers are saved by grace, by means of faith. Faith is the instrument by which we are saved. We're saved in the way of believing. A faith, though, does not save us. Faith, or to put it another way, faith is not the grounds or the basis of our salvation. Paul sets forth that truth in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. He says, Therefore by grace are ye saved through faith. Faith is the means, it's not the basis of our salvation. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the grace of God that saves, and that grace works in us through faith. As a result of God's work of grace in us, we are enabled to believe and to trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation. The grace of God is the ground of our salvation. Faith is the vehicle by which salvation is communicated and applied uh, to us. When Jesus says here, thy faith hath saved thee, he was saying that through faith, through the act of believing, this woman had received the blessings of salvation. And he then calls upon her to live in the knowledge of that salvation, in the knowledge of the forgiveness of her sins, in the knowledge of her debt having been paid, in the knowledge that her sins have been put away. And so he then says to her, go in peace. Go in peace. Go in peace is the language of reconciliation. And in those words we find confirmation that uh, this woman's love for Jesus was genuine. She could truly go in peace. She could go with the certainty that her sins had been forgiven. She go with the certainty that she had been reconciled to God. All was well. It did not matter what Simon thought. Uh, what mattered was the assessment of Jesus Christ. And the declaration of Jesus Christ was, My sins are forgiven. Go in peace. And brethren, that is what he says uh, to every believer here this evening. He says that here, he says that this evening to everyone that loves him. He says to us, by his grace, thy sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. Let's uh, stand for a brief uh, word of prayer. A little bit of today reflected upon uh, the work of our Saviour Jesus Christ and by, by his, his grace uh, we, we are those that can know uh, the reality of salvation. We can know what it is to have our sins forgiven. As those who know of that reality uh, let, let us live a uh, day by day. Uh, if we're those that have a realisation of the enormity of the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ, if we have an understanding of the uh, greatness of our sins and the greatness of the forgiveness that is to be 
has been uh, made available to us in Jesus Christ, then we will love much. We'll give of our souls. We'll commit our lives into his service. It won't just be by word of mouth. It'll be by the way in which we actually conduct ourselves day by day. And so tomorrow, as we go back to our usual activities, the work of the week, the things that you have set before us, let us reflect that. Let us reflect our love for Jesus Christ in the things that we do, the things that we say, and the way that we behave ourselves. This we pray for our Lord's sake. Amen. Final Psalm.